joining me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Elise Zipkin. Thank you so much for that nice announcement and also the invitation for coming. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about why monarch butterflies are declining. And this is research that my lab has been working on uh, for more than a decade now. So it's something that I've been thinking a lot about and I think it has important implications for how we think about biodiversity conservation more generally. So before I get into the details of the monarch story, I wanna kind of set the bigger picture. Um, so probably most of you here know that species around the world are declining. So rates of species extinctions are hundreds of times higher than historic background rates. And this is the most recent um, graph from the IUCN uh, showing the total number of species assessed and the total number of, of those that are threatened, have been categorized by threatened. Um, and so when we look at this number, it's nearly 30%, about 27% of species that have been assessed worldwide that are under this category, either because they're declining or because their populations are really small. So one of the grand challenges today in biodiversity conservation then is to determine how we can reverse those declines. First, why are the species declining? There might be different reasons in different areas or different taxonomic groups. And what can we do about it? Um, so generally, you know, in the past we might think, okay, let's uh, figure out where this species live and, you know, delineate some boundary around it and just protect that area in that. But protecting biodiversity is not necessarily so simple. And that's because many different factors may be influencing species dynamics and abundance inside and outside of where they are currently living or inhabiting. And environments are changing at really rapid paces uh, with climate change and other kinds of land use change. And also another really key challenge is that a lot of species use really spatially extensive habitat. So here's an example, I'm showing this cerulean warbler and that is listed as a um, threatened species. And it has this really, really wide um, range during this top part, let's see if this works. Yep, this top, this Northern part, you know, where they're spending their summers all the way down um, to the <clears throat> northern part of South America where they're overwintering. So it's not like we could just delineate a whole boundary on, on that area and try to protect it. So, so species conservation and biodiversity conservation in general can be really complicated. And that's kind of where my lab fits in. Our mission is to understand and predict how and why nature is changing, what the consequences of those changing are, and what can be done about it. And our main sort of thing, we work on all different taxonomic groups. This is just a sample of some that we do, some that we work on. But one of our um, main things that we do is we work on building different kinds of models. So we try to use really different kinds of data, put them together and answer those questions that other people have kind of thrown aside. I joke sometimes that, you know, our lab is trying to make lemonade out of lemons. We're, we're taking the scraps and trying to figure out the, all the bigger picture. So that brings me to this question of why are monarch butterflies just um, declining? And I think that monarchs are a really great case study for thinking about approaches for understanding and mitigating biodiversity declines for a couple of reasons. Um, first, and I'll show you some data on this in a little bit, but they are declining in a way that suggests multiple imposing factors might be influencing the dynamics. So it's likely not a simple, um, answer to the to the question of why they're declining. <clears throat> they're this really iconic species. You know, they're they're easy to identify monarchs. Um, they're uh, widespread across North America. And uh, because of that, there's lots of uh, potential data sources across America, collected mostly by citizen scientists, by volunteers. And finally, another reason is, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service and also recently the IUCN, the International Union for um, Conservation of Nature, has recognized these declines and uh, formally put out, put out a call that, that uh, their declines warrant listing um, under the Endangered Species Act. So there's a real need for it. So let's dig into this a little bit. So first, um, I just wanna show you a little bit of the data that how we know that monarchs are declining. So as you can imagine, there's hundreds of millions of monarchs across uh, North America, and we can't just count them all. So what we do, the best way that we find out how many monarchs there are is 
during their wintering time, when they're in these high elevation OML fir forests in central Mexico, um, researchers go around and they kind of delineate the area that's occupied by monarchs. So they, they form these really dense colonies on these trees. And, um, and then they take all the different spots where they're in high density and, and look at this number of hectares that are occupied. So this uh, graph here shows the different seasons, um, the different seasons on the x-axis, and the total number of area occupied by, uh, by monarchs during each of these years in that winter habitat. So what we can see is kind of this really stark decline with a more steep decline maybe in the early time series, um, maybe a few years of recovery, but overall this really downward trend. So to understand why that might be happening, we need to learn something a little bit about the monarch's life history. It has a really, really unique life history. So as I mentioned, monarchs overwinter in the um, high elevation OML fir forests in central Mexico, so that's around here. And then um, during the beginning of spring, they kind of um, reproduce, they, they mate while they're still in the colonies, but they produce that first generation in the spring breeding grounds, which are in eastern Texas and surrounding areas. So that's around early March. Then that first generation um, uses milkweed resources to grow and then they become uh, adults. And those adults spread out throughout the west of um, the eastern United States. So we're talking here about the eastern population of monarchs. So that's basically all the individuals east of the Rocky Mountains. And they mix together all as one population. Um, and then at the end of the summer, the last generation enters what we call reproductive diapause, which means that they kind of shut down their reproduction or, um, organs and they travel all the way back in that last generation, they travel all the way back to uh, Mexico to do that um, kind of quasi hibernation in those in those uh, high ele elevation OML for force. So they have this really unique migration that takes over four generations that they do the annual cycle. And they all come back to the same, um, same locations, which is just really, I've talked about this with many colleagues and you know, my friends who are experts at butterflies say there's no other ones that do exactly the same sort of thing. So what you can kind of start to see from that is that the dynamics that happen in one location and one season carry over into subsequent stages here. So this is an example chart uh, graph from work that we did earlier, where we're just looking at you know week within the year. So this is like during the summer period. And this is how many monarchs are in Ohio based on the weather conditions in Texas in the previous spring. So what does the summer abundance of monarchs look like in Ohio given the precipitation and the temperature in Texas. And what we can see is that there's big effects. For example, here that um, you know, we see uh, the most monarchs when the uh, temperatures are lower in Texas. So sorts of different, different things that are showing up. But basically what we find is one stage carries over. What happens in one stage has, tends to have a big impact on what's going on with monarchs in, in different stages. So there have been a few hypotheses put forward as to why monarchs declining, and I'm going to talk about kind of the three main ones, the milkweed limitation hypothesis, migration survival hypothesis, and the climate change hypothesis. So the milkweed limitation hypothesis is the basic idea that monarchs have been declining because a loss, um, a huge loss of their resource their resources milkweed. So monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed during the breeding season. The, once the eggs hatch, the different larval caterpillar stages eat that um, milkweed. And so there's multiple species in the milkweed family, but it's their obligate host plant. They must have that. And what I'm showing on the bottom graph here is this is in each year, the amount, the county level amount of glyphosate that have been sprayed on crops in those areas. So glyphosate, sometimes called Roundup Ready, is a, um, a uh, herbicide that kills uh, you know, all, all, everything that it touches, basically. And so with the adoption of these Roundup Ready crops, um, soybean and corn, what would happen is in the Midwest, 
um, these areas, big crop areas, would get sprayed really, really um, broadly. And milkweed used to live between the row crops and kind of at the edge of that. So because the uh, glyphosate is sprayed really, really broadly, milkweed can no longer live um, in between those row crops, in, which is huge areas in the Midwest. And from that, we know that there's a lot lower milkweed density across the landscape. So what we can see is once those kind of Roundup Ready crops were adopted um, between the mid-1990s and the mid-2000s, um, the usage went from just over zero of these areas up to about uh, 77 or 80 percent. And then it's kind of leveled off. So I'll show you that we're going to come back to this dashed line, but this is this mid-2000s um, era. And then during that, the reason this hypothesis has come forward is during that same period of time, that's when monarchs declined. And we see the steepest um, time of the decline in this early part when this uh, Roundup Ready use was really ramping up. So that's the first hypothesis as to why monarchs are declining. The second is called the migration survival hypothesis. And this is basically the idea that disease or reduced nectar availability combined with any sort of winter forest habitat loss, has led to lower migration survival during that fall period. So that time at the end of the summer, when that last generation goes all the way down from um, the upper Midwest to uh, the overwintering grounds in Mexico. And so I'll tell you the big reason for this hypothesis really relates to this graph, what I've got up here. So what I'm showing you up here on the top right is the expected number of counts at um, the North American Butterfly Association survey sites over the same time period um, as I showed you earlier, the declines. So what this is saying is that there's no trend. We see no decline in the counts of monarchs at these survey sites um, within the breeding range, so the upper Midwest area um, during the summer. Now these sites where this takes place are not necessarily random sites and they're not surveyed in a, um, a way that would necessarily get at the trend, but we wanna highlight here that this hypothesis came forward because people were not necessarily seeing the same declines on the summer breeding grounds as they were in the winter. So that led to this hypothesis that perhaps um, it was the migration during the fall that was problematic. And furthermore, some other research has shown that there actually is a strong link between um, the autumn landscape greenness during that migration route, particularly in the northern half and Texas area of the migration route, and the size of the overwintering colonies. And same thing with the amount of um, forest available for uh, monarchs when they first get down to the colonies. So there was some idea that perhaps the issue is loss of individuals during this long migration. And then the final hypothesis that has a lot of support is that um, direct and indirect effects of climate change have led to lower fecundity, um, lower survival, and possibly also lower milkweed within the landscape that has led to um, declines of of monarchs. So this is something that we've seen over and over again, where, uh, you know, what the weather conditions look like in both particularly the spring and the summer breeding areas can have a big um, effect on the size ultimately of the population. We also know, and this is just some, some, a study from um, an experiment of treatments of different temperatures that of course, if it gets too hot, uh, individuals can't survive. So that's something that we need to think about. So there's evidence that each of these hypotheses or each of these factors may be contributing to the decline. But what we really wanted to know is what is the relative contribution of stressors along that migratory route to monarch declines? So we, we accept that there's probably some combination of all of these, and we really want to understand which are the most um, having the most effect and what we might be seeing in the future. So our goal then was to develop this full annual cycle um, model to estimate this, to estimate the relative contribution. And I want to highlight here that this is work led by my former postdoc, Aaron Zylestra, who now works for um, the Audubon Society. And I uh, put the citation there, it was published um, last year in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. <laughs> 
So what we wanted to do, our goal with this, was to put together data from along the full annual cycle across the migratory route and get at what is the relative contribution of each of these stressors. But the thing is that monarch data are incomplete, patchy, and available from multiple sources that are of variable quality. So it's a tricky endeavor. Um, so I'm showing you just here different data availabilities, but what I also what this map um, doesn't really convey is that there's different qualities to some of the to the different data types. Yes, in fall there is um, opportunistic sightings. People can report, "Hey, I saw a monarch to." Um, some of these programs like iNaturalist you might have heard of, but these are not systematic surveys that are going out and collecting data on monarchs. So it's tricky just to put this all together and um, figure out what's going on. It's also over a really large space um, and during different time periods, all things that we need to consider as we put this together. So what my lab started working on is what we call data integration. Um, and that's an approach that we can combine the different data sources, accounting for these differences and potential errors in them to figure out what's going on. So because I'm a quantitative ecologist with a math background, I'm just gonna give you a little bit about the math um, and say, tell you just a short brief interlude on what is data integration. So first, it has a lot of different names, but um, also we call it integrative modeling. And it's basically this general idea of incorporating multiple different data sites into, on a single organism into a single modeling framework. Um, and typically, the data that we use uh, in these integrated models were not necessarily collected with the purpose of being together. They might be um, collected in different ways or be on different uh, aspects of the species. So the concept has been around in ecology for a while, but it's had um, kind of a, a huge um, uptake in the last uh, decade or so. So the idea with data integration is first we need to define what are specific data inputs, and these can be all different kinds of data. It could be something related to the counts of individuals, population census, something just as simple as it was here or it wasn't here, or just that it was here, we don't know where it was. We can use information about productivity, um, reproduction, or um, other kinds of data as well. And then what we do with those data is we specify a biological model. This is just a simple toy example, but essentially we say something like, um, there, if there were two stages, a juvenile and adult stage, juveniles survive to become adults, and then adults survive and reproduce to produce juveniles. So whatever the specific model is that makes sense for our population structure of our target organism. And then what we do is we think about how each of those various parameters, those survival ones that I talked about, can be put together into our model with the available data that we have and accounting for any nuanced parameters. So these are these things that I have in green here that we might have to account for the error in those data or the differences of how the data were collected. And then we analyze this model and estimate what the parameters are of that. So that's the general idea of what we're doing for this monarch model. We're developing this integrated full annual cycle model. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we have this really good data in the winter where all the monarchs are congregated in um, their wintering habitats in central Mexico. And we also have some structured data, which I alluded to in the summer, where there are surveys across the Midwestern breeding grounds, systematic surveys. Um, however, we don't have those same kind of high quality data in either spring or autumn. And that has a lot to do with the fact that monarchs are really moving quickly during that time. Um, and so it's difficult to collect data on the model. So basically what we're doing is we're modeling using the data from the winter and the summer and inferring things about the um, spring and autumn. So the model has two components, a summer and a winter um, subcomponent. So in the summer model, um, <clears throat> I wanna just highlight what kind of data that we have available. So we have two types of data. So we have this census surveys, what we call, that were led by the North American Butterfly Association. So those are the points that I alluded to earlier. Um, and so those are all the blue ones up on here. And you can see, that there is um, some spreading out, of course, across this region, but there's also bias in, in locations, you know, where, where there are people and where there are cities. 
And those are collected once during the year where a group of individuals um, come together, they survey a large area, they record how many people are doing it and how much time they spend, and they record every butterfly that they come across. So we call them census counts. The other type of data are these state monitoring networks. Um, and there were four that we used from Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, and Michigan. And although that these are not quite as widespread, the data from here are extremely high quality. So these are individuals who volunteer. They walk transects, so these lines, um, through these unforested areas, and they record every uh, butterfly that they see during that time. Um, and they walk the same transects every week throughout the summer. So we have this repeated uh, surveys throughout different times of the summer. And many of them do that for multiple years. So these are highly trained volunteers who really, really know what they're doing. So again, you can see we have pretty good spatial coverage over this area, which in the Midwest. And I mentioned to you that monarchs um, do spread out everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. But through some stable isotope analysis, we know that most of the individuals that uh, end up making it down to Mexico come from this kind of central area. So this is the core breeding area. So again, there's issues that we have to deal with because we see this kind of aggregation, like that's Chicago area around Chicago and other cities, but it's a lot of data. Actually, this was over this time period, something like 18,000 surveys. So for our summer submodel, what we want decided to do is to not, um, to take, you know, to account for this issue where this, uh, the sampling is spatially biased, is what we decided to do was to model individual survey locations, so where a survey had taken place, as being related to what the mean of the county was during the particular time period, and any other kind of covariates that account for the survey method, methods and the amount of effort is in there. Then we model the, to the count um, related to each county, related to the ecological variables of interest. So we can group those broadly, we group them into four different categories. So the size of the population at the end of the winter, we have a count, in addition to having this kind of early winter count in December when the monarchs first land, we also have a late winter count um, in February before their start migration off uh, further northward. So we use the size of the population at the end of winter, and then we use spring weather variables, which is a suite of variables related to um, the, uh, the temperature, the precipitation, um, and same thing with the uh, summer. We use summer weather variables, a suite of them as well, also related to temperature and precipitation and average conditions through time and space across, across the Midwest. And we also include covariates related to the amount of crop cover and the herbicide application. So that's how we look at what the size, that's how we're modeling what the size of the summer population is. For the winter sum model, um, again, what I mentioned to you is that the size of the colonies is what we use. So the area occupied, the hectares occupied by um, monarchs is the data that we use for um, estimating what is the size of the population. So even though, um, I guess I'll, I'll show you really quickly, it's, they're congregated, uh, the colonies are congregated on the tops of these um, mountains. So they are separated slightly geographically. Um, so it actually breaks down to something like uh, 19 colonies, 13 super colonies. And you can see that there's variation in their sizes by year. Some are bigger overall and some are small. And so for this, what we do is we model that area occupied um, related to the ecological covariates, and those were one, what was the size of the summer population? So how big was that summer population at the very end of the summer, that peak summer population size? The amount of nectar availability during that migration southward, and um, what the forest cover looks like during um, the early winter. So if how much core forest area there is around these specific colony sites. Okay, so what we need to do now with these two components is we need to link the summer and winter components of the model. So <clears throat> the way that we do this is we create an index of that peak summer abundance population from that summer component of the model. 
So what we do is we predict um, monarch counts during peak summer. So that's kind of the end right before the population does the migration. And here's an example here from 2010. And then we take an average across all those counties um, to get an index for the year. What was the size of the population? An index of the size of the population. And we use that summer index, that peak summer index, as the covariate in our winter component of the model. So that goes in then as a, a predictor variable, where our response is the early winter population. And that's how we link these two components of the model. So reminder again, um, that's the model we want to analyze that and estimate what are, how much each of these variables are influencing the size of the population. But what we really want to know is the relative contribution of all the stressors along the migratory route to the decline. So not just what is the values of those parameters. So <clears throat> what we had to do is do this approach called hierarchical partitioning. And essentially what we do is we broke all the covariate up into these, the groups that I mentioned. So what was the size of the winter population, the spring weather conditions, the summer weather conditions, and the summer landscape cover. And we run the model with and without every different group of covariates, and we see how well our model fits. And using that difference in the log likelihood, which is a metric of how well our model fits the data, for every possible group combination, we can actually say how much variance is explained by each subset of the covariates. So we can say, all right, we can attribute this percent or that percent of the variation to the different categories of covariates. So what, and, and by the way, I know, I know uh, maybe people aren't always interested in all the technical details, but this was really, really hard. So I have to point out that um, it was a part of the project that took us a really long time to figure out. So I want to point it out. OK, so what did we find? Um, well, what was interesting is we found strong support for the climate change hypothesis. Um, so interestingly, I want to note that we were only able to run this model from mid 2000s to 2018, which is the end of our data. So 15 year time period. The time period before that, from the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s, was just really, really had very limited data. So we weren't able to look at this. So really, we found strong support for the climate change hypothesis from the early 2000, mid 2000s, from about 2004 till almost the present time. So this is the relative importance of each of these variables. And what we can see is that uh, spring weather conditions followed by um, summer weather conditions were the most, um, explain the most variance in our model. So basically, spring and summer weather conditions um, explain more than seven times, were more than seven times more important than other factors in explaining the variation. So um, we also, of course, did see some effect of differences um, on the how much crop was in a county and how much herbicide was sprayed. But uh, most of that variation in that glyphosate use in that um, Roundup Ready spray was attributable differences between counties, and the annual change um, was less than 26%. So there wasn't a big change from year to year. And again, if we show this figure, this is from earlier, that's not surprising, because we're modeling this time period from after this dashed line. And you can see it's sort of, there. there is some change year to year, but mostly it's fairly stable compared to this time period where there was a lot of change temporally. And then after that, what we found is that the size of the summer population was by far more um, the biggest predictor of how big the winter population would be. So explain more than 90% of the variance. Of course, there were some small effects of how much forest cover there was and nectar availability, but those were only about 10% of the variance explained. So that brings us back to the migration hypothesis. Um, uh, and what we found when we looked at that, what we did with our index, we made this index of our peak summer population size. And when we did that, we actually did find that the summer counts were declining. So that original data that people had been using from those North American Butterfly Association that were sort of more limited, there were less of those, they were only conducted once a year. Um, if you just took a course index of that, you won't see the decline in monarchs. But 
if you integrate in all the data that we have available across the full breeding area, um, then we actually do see that there is a decline in monarchs. Now, the steepest decline, again, we estimate during this time period before um, 2004, but again, there's a lot of uncertainty on the sizes each year, but there is still decline after 2004 as well. So what's going on exactly? What is going on? So <clears throat> the monarch, what we found over this time period is that the monarch breeding range is getting warmer. So first, this is a graph here where I'm showing growing degree day, which is essentially a temperature, a metric of cumulative temperature. And this is deviations from that growing degree day at different points here, on here. And what we find, and I'm, I'm plotting what the monarch counts look like for an area within our range that was cool, that was average, and that was warm. So cool would be like Minnesota, Average is, you know, maybe Michigan and warm is, um, you know, Ohio, something like that. So temperature increases are good uh, for monarch abundance. When we see higher temperature, we do, um, we do tend to see more monarchs that are able, being able to produce. But that wasn't true in the warmest areas. So in, that was only true in the cold areas. So this is a cool area. So if you were further north and it was warmer, that's better. That you'll get more monarchs out. But if you're um, in the southern part of the range, or even the average, what we see is it starts to saturate off. So it doesn't help to be much warmer in those already warm areas. And interestingly, what we found is that temperature increased the most in the warm southern regions from this 1994 to 2003 decade up to 2004 and 2018. So this is the differentials of temperature that were observed in these locations. So what you can see is it got hotter in this uh, southern area. And actually, some of these sites up here where it would be better if it was warmer are cooler. So just to note, this is contrary to what we see in predictions for climate change into the future. In the future, what we're seeing is that we predict more northern areas are going to be warming quickly. But what actually happened between one de decade to the next at this time period wasn't that. And that kind of shows the variability of what's going on. The southern part got warmer in the summer, and the northern part actually was a little bit cooler on average. So that's some reason of why we probably have been still seeing monarch declines in the last 15 years. Um, but I think that it's important to note that it's not enough to just understand monarch trajectories. What we really want to do, and what I talked about at the beginning, is we want to figure out what we can do to mitigate and reverse these declines. And that's kind of an important next step. We want to see why monarchs are declining and, and biodiversity in general, but we really want to figure out what's the best thing for moving forward. So what we did is um, we decided to project do predictions on monarch trajectories into the future. And the way that we had to do this is we had to combine our population model um, with various climate change scenarios. So what we do is we run multiple um, projections of what the climate might look like in the near term, in the end of the century, and under different um, possible scenarios. And we use our population models um, and the parameters estimated in them to look combined with those projections to get a population forecast. And one of the things that's really interesting about this approach is it allows us to parse out where we're uncertain, what we're uncertain about. Are we uncertain about the climate? Are we actually uncertain about our population model? What is leading to the biggest source of uncertainty by taking these in there? And that's also really important because that can help us figure out how to refine projections into the future. OK, so the first thing we needed to do was make these climate projections. <clears throat> and so for that, we did three different time periods. We picked a 20-year period in the near future, the mid-century, and the end of century. And then what we did um, is for each variable, each reason, we used <clears throat> four different scenarios, global change scenarios, using five global circulation models. So this gets a little complicated, and I have to admit, we used um, we have a collaborator, Naresh Yupin, who I'll show at the end, um, who is our climate scientist who did this. But let me explain a little bit what's going on. So these different climate change scenarios, so this is the different um, columns, are basically conditions about what the future will look like. 
For example, if we met the Paris Accords, you know, and emissions are kept to less than, you know, one and a half degrees, all the way up to our sort of business as usual, um, this last category where we would see several degrees of warming. So that's what the differences of these are. And then how did we pick these global circulation models? So there's about 40 models that people are running all over the world to try and predict what is the future going to look like. So what we did is we looked at that suite of models and we saw, we saw, we took how well these models were predicting our variables of interest within the recent past in the locations that we're interested. So how well did these global circulation models predict um, what the spring and the uh, summer climate conditions looked like in Texas area and the Midwest during these time periods that we were um, that we were interested in in the recent past. And if those models did well, we set a criteria, we moved them forward. So there were five of those models out of those, you know, tens of models um, that met our criteria and had done well at predicting in the certain locations and variables that we were interested in. So we used an ensemble of those. And then what we did is we projected the weather variables for our regions of interest, the spring breeding um, area in eastern Texas and the summer breeding area. So the exact areas where we were calculating those variables in the model. So both that whole suite of variables related to temperature, precipitation, climate of temperature, average values, all that stuff. So what did we find with the climate projections? So this is a... Um, a uh, graph that's showing the growing degree day. So again, that's a metric of temperature and precipitation. Um, and the points in there are the values from our 15 years. So what we can see is in the short term, this is this blue box here, the um, values in the of these are maybe gonna be a little bit warmer about the same precipitation, but pretty close under low climate change, or under low emission scenario. So if we see low emission scenario. And that stays even pretty consistent towards the end of the century. However, as we go into higher emission scenarios, so this is the um, red is the highest emission scenario, we see that the area, uh, this, this area in Texas is likely to get hotter. So this is what this box indicates, that there are more, gonna be more values in this kind of um, side to the right, and possibly even a little bit drier too. So this is just a summary of what this looks like. Mostly warmer springs, especially under the highest levels of emissions. What about the summer? Well, the summer, what we found is that there's gonna be warmer summers. So under this low emission scenario on the right, we see that areas are getting warmer, but some of those areas in the south, um, in the southern part of the range, are not getting quite as warm compared to um, the northern part. And again, remember, this is opposite of what we had seen in the decade before. These are the predictions of what the future will be like. However, under high emissions, you know, everything basically gets warmer with the more northern parts getting warmer, um, getting w warmer quickly. And interestingly, also, we see that there's likely to be wetter summers in the eastern part of the range, but not the western part. So this is the percent change in these values. And what you can see is under both low and high emissions, we see these areas, Michigan, um, Ohio, Indiana, they're still getting a, they're getting a little bit wetter. So not getting that much hotter and they're getting wetter, whereas the western part of the range is predicted to get drier. So what does this mean for monarchs? So again, this was the overwintering population size um, in the past. And what we wanna do is use those metrics to produce what that will look like in the future. So this line, this dashed line here is the average throughout this time period from 2004 to 2018 with some error, that's what the shade it is. And what we can see is, in the, these are um, on the different emission scenarios. So this is the average of all those global change models or global circulation models and um, in, under the different emission scenarios. So in the near term, we don't see much variation um, in the mean values. That extends much further as we go further on in the time series. So under high emissions, we see much, much fewer monarchs than um, under lower emissions. But we also see that there's a lot of variation. So there's expected to be a lot of variation in the size year to year of the population of monarchs. 
So what we did is we forecasted the total number of years below the historical minimum. So in 2014, the population was down to only 0 0.67 hectares occupied. And what we found is even in the short term under low submissions, we have an average about two to three um, years in the next 20 years that we expect the population to reach its size smaller than it's ever been before. Um, and so that's something that we wanted to think about is even though on average it might be okay, there could be years where it drops really low and that can have you know, some potentially bad consequences. But we also wanted to look at what does the population likely to look like across the Midwestern summer breeding range. So here's a, um, a map here that shows the expected counts in counties across the Midwestern breeding range. So this is kind of the average for the, the full time period um, of the two, 2004 to 2018. And then what we did is projected the change, the percent change under different um, emission scenarios. So in the near term, interestingly in the near term, under low submissions, we actually might see an increase in some of these areas. So that's this uh, blue areas um, in the size of the monarch population. Again, these are the areas that are not really getting hotter, but they're getting wetter. Whereas areas further north and to the west, um, we are likely to see declines in monarch populations. And then of course, under um, high emissions, way into the future, um, you know, we're likely to see uh, many more declines across, across the breeding area. So I think what's important about this is what are the conservation implications? I, you know, I, I really think that it's important, yes, there's a message that monarchs are declining and there are species that we care about, but that's kind of not enough. We need to really be thinking about what can we do about it. I'm always hopeful about this. I think that it's important to note that there's still a lot of things that people could do. So one of the things that we really wanted to focus on while we were doing this is to try and think about what's the message behind this for conservation. So what we think based on those maps is that the most effective ways for doing conservation will be to target restoration and conservation activities in those areas where climate is projected to be favorable. So we have this county to county map, which can help us understand where we're likely to see um, potential improvements in the habitat for and climate conditions for monarchs. The other thing that we can do is we can collect targeted data to um, reduce parameter uncertainty. I didn't show you these results, but one of the things I mentioned early is that our model is able to tell us where we're most uncertain about. Of course, long into the future, at the end of the century, the thing that we're most uncertain about is what the climate is going to look like. But it actually turns out in the short term, the thing that we were most uncertain about is um, our parameter estimates, how well our model can really estimate those relationship between monarchs and, uh, and each of the different weather variables. And that suggests that actually if we do some targeted data collections in areas, specific areas that we're missing within our surveys, we can understand um, a little bit more about what's going on with monarchs, help refine these models and figure out even more precisely where to, to target conservation. So with that, um, another next step that we're doing with our model um, is trying to look more explicitly at what's going on with that spring. So we know that spring conditions are important, right? We've, we've established that. But there are no structured monarch day available, available from spring. And there never really will, will be. A lot of times, you know, we hear collect more data, collect more data. But monarchs are in a very, very low density over a very, very large range in Texas, in eastern Texas, and most of that's private land. So it's unrealistic that we're going to be able to set up a structured survey and count the monarchs that we need. So instead, what we need to rely on is this opportunistic data, which I kind of mentioned to you earlier. So there are several programs out there where people can report, like for example, on your iPhone, you can report into iNaturalist, um, hey, I saw a monarch. And we see a lot of data like that. There's also a program called Journey North where people can report the first monarch that they've seen in the year. So now we're working on combining these opportunistic data, which have their own sets of challenges for incorporating into a model to try and understand precisely what's going on with the spring and where are um, you know, potentially good areas in this spring breeding area um, into the future and where we might, again, target conservation there as well.
So that kind of sums up the monarchs, but I want to step back for a second and really highlight the conservation opportunities. So sometimes it can feel like there's doom and gloom with loss of biodiversity and things like climate change, but I actually think there's a lot of amazing things that can be done. And one of those is really, really exciting, I think related to volunteer citizen science programs. So there are now so much data available and so many programs out there. So I went on this um, website called SciStarter. There's more than 1,100 citizen science programs globally that you can get involved with and other people can get involved with. And there's just so much data that are being collected that researchers could not collect. I mean, as I hope you kind of saw with the Monarch data, it's not like me, my lab group, or even teams of, lab, of labs could work together and collect the 18,000 you know, surveys that have been collected over, um, you know, 30 years. So we're relying more and more on, um, on citizens, on volunteers to go out and collect the data. And those data are really, really valuable. So for example, you know, I just downloaded this at 3 p.m. one day, and there was already 15,000 um, observations that had been uploaded to eBird, which is a data uh, website where you can, you know, report seeing different birds. So it's just amazing kind of what's out there and what can be done and how useful these data can be um, to scientists like me who are putting them together to try and figure out what's going on. And then from the perspective of our lab, one of the things that we're thinking about is how can we develop generalizable models? You know, um, many, many species are threatened. And here, you know, this is just, I'm showing the number of threatened mammals by country. And we can see that, you know, monarchs is just one of them. And the things that we really want to be able to do is more rapidly assess multiple species and potentially simultaneously using the available data for each species to really get an idea of what's going on more broadly. So with that, I would really like to acknowledge and thank everybody on this research team, the Monarch Project. Like I said, we've been doing this for more than a decade. Um, primarily, I've been working with my collaborator, Leslie Reese at Georgetown University. Um, and several people from my um, lab have worked on this project. I talked mostly about Aaron Zylistra's work, but Sarah Saunders and Matt Farr have also contributed quite a bit. Karen Oberhauser at University of Wisconsin. Nuresh Nupin, who's also at Georgetown University. He is the climate scientist that I mentioned. And then we have two really wonderful colleagues, and many more actually, in Mexico that we've worked a lot with. Um, Eduardo Renand is uh, the lead data collector. He works at WWF, um, who is in charge of collecting all those data um, on monarchs in Mexico. And Isabella Ramirez um, has been doing all that uh, spatial modeling of what the habitats look like at um, each of the winter colony sites. So I think this has been this has been a huge group effort and um, something you know that that takes I feel like uh, you know the continent people across the continent to really figure out. And then finally, I'd like to thank our funders. We've been primarily funded by the National Science Foundation, but also by several entities in the Department of Interior, the USGS, uh, National Park Service, and Fish and Wildlife Service, along with the Forest Service. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.